Our first plenary speaker is Mark Horowitz, who is the Yahoo Founders Professor at Stanford University and was Chair of the Electrical Engineering Department from 2008 to 2012. Mark received his BS and MS degrees in Electrical Engineering from MIT in 1978 and his PhD from Stanford in 1984. Since 1984, he has been a professor at Stanford working in the area of digital integrated circuit design. In 1990, Mark took leave from Stanford and co-founded Rambus. Mark's research interests are quite broad and span using EE and CS analysis methods to creating new design methodologies for analog and digital VLSI circuits to problems in molecular biology. Mark is a fellow of IEEE and ACM and a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Science. Mark received the IEEE Donald O. Peterson Award in Solid State Circuits in 2006. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Horowitz. Welcome. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about computing's energy problem and what we can do about it. Now I don't think I need to tell this audience about the fact that today everything seems to have a computer in it. And that includes my personal favorite. Computing is so cheap that we have greeting cards that have computers in them, so computing has truly become disposable. Now, we don't have computers and everything because we want to put computing in everything. We have it because computing is just incredibly cheap. And the reason it's so cheap can be explained by two simple laws that were, um, ca came up by very famous people. The first, obviously, is Moore's Law, which said that we can make the devices that we build computers out of increasingly inexpensive over time. And then, of course, there's Bob Denard's rule about scaling, which said that not only do these um, gates and computers become cheaper, but they also become faster and much more energy efficient. So this has led to sort of an expectation not only among the technical community, but among the general population that computing devices are going to become ever cheaper, smaller, and lower power. And there's lots of reasons that they should believe this, because after all, supercomputers uh, a couple decades ago, like a Cray-1, now could fit on a couple millimeters of silicon, dissipate under a watt in power, and actually have a performance that's 10 times greater than that machine. So through my career, it's been true that the biggest computer that we had to share among a number of people now fit in the cell phone that I have in my pocket. And lots of part charts and evidence can be um, given for this great improvement in performance. Um, a number of people have put together a database of microprocessors. It's located on the web called cpudb.stanford.edu. And what we've done is all the microprocessors we can get our hands on, we put them in this table. And so we can plot the performance over time. And this is a plot of the CMOS microprocessors. And you can see over the past 30 years, they've increased in performance by about four orders of magnitude. Now, this might lead you to believe that this computing scaling that we've all come to sort of expect is going to happen um, in perpetuity. But in fact, the ducks are pedaling really hard in this region. And I can show you that by this plot, which is a, another plot of the microprocessor data that indicates what the clock frequency is over time. And what you see is there was a dramatic change around 2005 where clock frequency of microprocessors stopped scaling. Now, in order to scale performance when you don't scale clock frequency is much harder, and that's why the ducks are paddling so hard. Paddling so hard, sorry. Um, they're not riding bicycles. Um, but the reason that we ran into this problem is shown on the next slide, which says that during this period of time when we were scaling clock frequency so fast, we were also scaling up power density. So this isn't the total power. This is in watts per square millimeter. So processor dies are on the order of 100 to 200 square millimeters. So when you're getting up to the one watt range, you're actually talking about a die that's a couple hundred watts. 
And what you see is that sometime in the, in the 2000, mid-2000 decade, we really hit a power limit and we were no longer able to scale up power um, because of various thermal issues. Now, in the desktop and server community, that happens around 100 watts. In the laptops, it's about 30 watts. And in a cell phone, it's somewhere between 1 and 3 watts. But what it means today is that all of our computing systems, systems are now power limited. Now, if you remember um, Denard's scaling rules, he actually said that if you scale lithographic features and voltages the same, the power density should remain the same. Well, what happened was we were a little, you might say, greedy, and we scaled clock frequencies much faster than you should have scaled simply by technology. So what that means is that by 2005, we were running clocks 10 times faster than we should have if we just scaled along the technology scaling curve. Um, but what we were doing was actually not greedy, but we were clever because we were trading off, we were doing arbitrage between something that the users didn't care too much about, the power of the chip, to get a quantity that the users did care a lot about, which was performance. Unfortunately, we ran into this power wall and we can no longer increase power. So you might think, well, look, over a decade now of not scaling frequency, we finally regress back to the, to the norm, and maybe we can continue scaling frequency. But that's unfortunately not the case, because during this period of time, we were scaling power supply voltages, but we weren't quite scaling them as fast as we should have. That would have been a long proportional to the length. We're only scaling them roughly about square root or a little bit faster than square root. But even more problematic is that if you look recently, power supply voltages haven't been scaling at all. Now, I should note that these voltages that I've got on this chart are not actually precisely right because all modern microprocessors don't operate at a supply voltage. They tell the power supply what voltage to operate at because that saves power. Um, but I have a lot of computers, and, I, and there are programs that tell you what the power supply voltage is. And modern processors have run about a volt to 0.9 volts until the latest generation. So that in the 3D FinFET generation, they seem to have been able to lower the power supply by about 100 millivolts or so. So we're down to 800 millivolts. But we are no longer scaling power supplies very rapidly at all. And what that means is if you look at the power equation up here, if VDD is not scaling very much, then the only thing that's going to scale power from a technology perspective is the fact that the capacitance scales as you make things smaller. So we should take a second um, and think about what the ramifications of this are, because this, in, in essence, is the computing's power problem. Because technology is no longer changing the energy per gates evaluation very much, we're stuck, because power is just the energy it takes to compute every operation you want to do times the number of operations per second. That's energy per second, power. So if the energy per op is not scaling and we're power limited, we won't be able to scale ops per second. The only way we can get the operations per second to increase is if we decrease the energy per op. OK, so given that CMOS technology after 30 years is finally running out of steam, the natural inclination of any good computer architect is to say, well, let's just change technology. After all, the first computing machines that were built were mechanical. Then we built them out of tubes. And then within a couple years after transistors were invented, we built computers out of transistors. Then we built them out of bipolar integrated circuits. Then NMOS integrated circuits. And in the 80s, when NMOS integrated circuits were reaching the ungodly power of a couple watts to 10 watts, we moved to CMOS. And if CMOS integrated circuits are now running out of steam, why don't we just go to some new technology? Let's call it technology X. And I will tell you that you read in the papers every week about some new technology that's going to make computing better. Unfortunately, I am not optimistic that we're going to find a technology that's going to replace CMOS for computing. And I think this comes down to two fundamental problems. The first one is technical. And the second one is economic. So on the technical side, the problem is that our problems with CMOS transistors have to do with leakage and how much, how much voltage we need to turn the transistor off and then turn it really on. 
And that has to do with Boltzmann statistics and energy and carrier densities surmounting an energy barrier. And as long as your charge carriers have a charge of one on them, we're not going to be able to solve this problem. So to solve this problem, we're going to have to do something very different. You know, if anybody were, you know, wondered why a brain can operate at 100 millivolts and we need to operate at about a volt, it's because the basic mechanism in neurons actually has about 12 charge on it. So it's not KT on Q, it's KT on 12 Q. That allows them to decrease the voltage by about uh, a factor of 10. But I tell you, brains are not like transistors, so you know, that's really different. The second problem has to do with economics, which is that even though we complain about our technology and say it's not scaling like we want it to, it is frickin' amazing of what it can do today. We can build gates that dissipate femtojoules of energy for every gate evaluation. They evaluate in, in picoseconds. And we can build a billion of them on a chip and expect them all to work. And that leads to the perfect catch-22 for a new technology for computing. This is a highly scientific graph that I just drew in PowerPoint that has on one axis the investment risk, how risky an investment is, and how much money you can get. So if you're not asking for very much money, you probably have a friend or somebody else who can give you a little bit of money to play around. An angel investor is even better because then they're not your friend. Um, but as you start asking for real money in terms of hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, the number of people you can ask goes down, and those people tend to be much more conservative. So if you think about trying to create a new technology for computing, we said that that technology has to be very different to get around these fundamental physical issues. That means it's basically high investment risk up here. If you want to build a computing device that has a billion devices on it that all work, that's going to take you a lot of capital. So we find out that to do this, we're going to have to be in this space, which is really very far away from the feasible curve. So I think the ramification of this is while I hope and pray that new technology will save us, I'm not going to count my career on it. Now, you might think I'm just being overly pessimistic and I don't understand how innovation works. And you might be right. But I think I do understand at least a little bit about how innovation works. And in my observation, the truth about innovation is it starts by creating new markets. So think about all the billion dollar companies that have been created by technology. They didn't basically take over a billion dollar market from somebody. They created that market from scratch. And that market became so large that then they compete with the established players. You know, the best, best example of this is Microsoft, which isn't even on the curve, okay? Because they started with this PC thing. That wasn't a big market when they started, but now they're a very large software company. The same thing is true for the iPod. They started by creating the online music store. So if I'm right, then I think compute, then computing will remain in CMOS, and we're going to have to deal with the limitations that it has. So that has two ramifications that I think are important to think about. The first is, just to step back what I said, the reason it's hard to displace CMOS is because its capabilities are so amazing. You know, think about it. We can build a computer and a wireless communication device on a single chip of silicon, sell that chip for under a buck, and still make money. What that means is that there's a tremendous opportunity to innovate by figuring out how we can make the world a better place by adding commuting, communication and computing to it. And that's partially the reason why you have so many devices that have computers in it today. And that innovation is just starting because of the capabilities of our technology. But the second ramification of this CMOS-based computing is that all performance systems are going to be energy limited. And if we want to continue to scale performance like people expect, expect us to, we're going to have to figure out clever ways to decrease the energy per op. So if your job is to basically decrease the energy per operation, what is it that you're trying to do? Well, basically, it means that you should think about every design you could create or think about 
in terms of two parameters. One is how much energy per op does this design take versus how much performance does this design yield? There isn't a single optimal design. There is a set of designs in this space. And what you want to do is you want to get as far down as you can. So if you need a certain amount of performance, you want to find the lowest possible energy per op that still yields that performance. This optimal curve typically has a set of diminishing returns. So as you go lower and lower in performance, you tend to bottom out on some minimum energy that's required. Similarly, as you add energy and energy, there typically is some maximum performance you can achieve. So your goal is to move from here down to this curve or figure out clever ways to move this curve down and to the right. Now, if you think about this kind of trade-off curve, you can easily see why everybody sells multiprocessors today instead of selling a uniprocessor. If it is the case to increase performance, we have to increase energy per op, we're stuck. We have to decrease energy per op to increase performance if we're power limited. So imagine now, instead of putting one processor, I'm going to put four processors. So my performance curve is going to move shift to the right. Now what I can do is instead of building a processor way up here, which has very high energy per op, I can actually build a processor that was down here on the curve. But I have four of them, so my performance moves out. So by backing off on the peak performance on a per processor basis, we can lower the energy per op. And that allows us to put more processors on the die in the same energy budget. And that's what's happened. And that's the reason that we, everybody has multiprocessors today, even in your cell phones. But this has led to a prediction that is just not going to happen, which is people are predicting that we're going to have thousands of processors on a die. Now, if we take aside the GPUs, which are a, a different beast, and I can talk about those later if you would like, um, it's the problem with scaling is that, remember, we only got more processors because we made each processor more energy efficient. If after we did the first scaling by four, we do it again, notice what happens. We're now already at a, at a sort of efficient place, and the energy savings we get from scaling again is not that large because we're on this curve of diminishing returns. That is, once we have an efficient processor core, making it slower doesn't save that much energy, and therefore, we can't get much more performance. And in fact, this points out an important observation, which is that if you're building a machine or if your application is parallel, you shouldn't plot energy per op versus performance because you can always increase performance by increasing the number of processors. But that costs more silicon. So instead, what you should plot is energy per op versus millimeters per op per second. Or said differently, if you're thinking about something that's floating point based, watts per gigaflop and millimeters squared per gigaflop. Because as I make things more parallel, it takes me more square millimeters. So this allows me to do my trade off between the silicon cost and the energy cost. And it turns out this curve also has diminishing returns. And it's very easy to do the optimization. And one thing I'll point out is that people who really think about very low voltage, you're pushing the square millimeters per op very high. And typically, at some point, that's not going to be optimal. OK, well, we've known about this for a decade. And CPU designers and digital guys are not dumb. And we have been optimizing these cores and um, GPUs for a long time. We have been optimizing so much, we have a really shiny ball. Okay, so the question is, what do we do now? Because this shiny ball, that's what we did for the past decade. What are we going to do for the next decade? And this has led to a lot of discussion about building specialized hardware. Because many people have created graphs that look like this. This was created by a friend of mine, um, Dan Markovic, um, which he presented in a class at Stanford. But he shows the energy per op for CPUs, CPUs and GPUs, DSPs. And then there's this dedicated specialized hardware. And notice that the specialized hardware is a 1,000 times better in energy per op than a general purpose processor. So if we think to increase performance, we need to increase energy per op. It definitely seems that we should look at specialized hardware. And in particular, we see all these 
papers about dark silicon and the rise of specialization and specialized computing cores. So it's a very hot topic in the architecture space. But before we talk about specializations, there's just one thing I think we should check first. And that is, we shouldn't forget about the memory energy. So, so far we've been talking a lot about processors. And I'll go back to this plot, which is, again, from the CPU database. And the, there's one thing that bothered us when we looked at this data, is it really appeared that the older processors were more energy efficient than the newer ones. And that kind of didn't make sense because designers aren't dumb. We've been learning better ways to make things efficient. So why should the older processors be more efficient? Yes, they were simpler, but is that all? And then we realized, well, we made a big mistake when we made this curve. And the mistake is that we forgot to in, in, include a memory system for these older processors. These older processors ran at lower frequencies. They didn't need very large caches. But if we're going to move them to a modern technology and have them run at a gigahertz, we really do need to build a memory system for them. When we add that memory system, we were sort of surprised to see how much the energy increased. That is, the energy of the memory system was larger than the processor core by factors of two or more. So we thought, well, maybe we have this wrong. So I talked to some friends of mine who basically gave me um, an energy breakdown for a modern processor. I can't say which processor it is because the data is not public. But this is an eight core out of issue, out of order issue processor, you know, with a three level cache hierarchy. And what you notice is that the processor cores take about half the energy, and the memory system, on die memory system, takes about another half of the energy. But if you look at from a single core perspective, obviously it takes one eighth of the processor, and that energy is much less than the energy of just the third level cache. Now, it is true that the energy of the first and second level caches will scale with the number of processors, but the third level cache energy won't scale because it's what it's necessary to basically filter re, um, the requests to keep the memory stall time reasonable. So it's not unreasonable to assume that the memory for a single simple processor, your memory energy is going to dominate your processor core energy. Furthermore, I've only been talking about the on-die memory system. The memory system also has DRAM associated with it. And this is from data from Google data centers. And what you notice is that at the normal utilization of the processors, the processor cores are taking about between 30 and 40% of the total energy of the server. And the memory system, just the DRAM, external memory system, takes about 25. OK, so if you look at this, the total memory system energy in a normal computer is probably somewhere between half to 3 quarters of the total energy that the, the processor dissipates. If this is the case, how in the heck is specialization going to help us? And in particular, what's going on here? How, you know, Amdahl's law says the maximum we should be able to do is a factor of two if all the energy is in the memory system. So let me tell you the dirty little secret about ASICs and hardware specialization, which is that when you build an ASIC, you don't build an ASIC to do every computation. You build an ASIC or a specialized piece of hardware to do a specific computation. And the kinds of computation you choose to put on ASICs have a very restricted form, because they basically can't touch memory. Because if they touch memory, they're going to not get the efficiency they need. And so if you think about all the stuff that you build ASICs for, the modem processing, the image processing, um, all of that stuff has extreme locality. Um, video compression, decompression is just like that. So if you think about applications that don't access memory very much, you can see why specialization can help. And that's shown kind of in the bottom here. If you look at in a 45 nanometer technology, a very simple processor, the instruction energy is about 70 picojoules. About a third of it is just to access the instruction cache and decode the instruction. There's some stuff for register files, and there's just the pipeline registers in the machine take energy. But the add, the thing that you're trying to do, is a fraction of a picojoule. So right there, you can see there's a couple of orders of magnitude you could save if you could just get rid of all the overhead. But I just want to point out that if you even access not the DRAM, but just your local instruction data cache, that's 20 picojoules. 
that's about you know, another third of the instructions. So if you're doing decache accesses, the best you can do is about a factor of three or four. OK, so the truth about basically the specialization is it's not so much about the hardware. It is, but first, before you can do the hardware trick, you have to move the algorithm you have from the space of all possible algorithms into a much more restricted space. You want to move it to the GPU, which is data parallel if you can. But what you really want to do is you want to move it to here. This is that sweet spot that has no communication. It's very intensive in terms of arithmetics. And in fact, those arithmetics are actually integers, not floating point. OK, so is this good news or bad news? Like most things in life, it's both. It's bad news because it says that the set of applications that we can really do is restricted. But let's turn that into good news. The set of applications that we can build efficient computing for is very restricted. If it's very restricted, that means we might be able to build a more general engine that can handle applications of that class. So what class are we talking about? What kinds of application could possibly have such high locality? Well, we talk about these applications as being stencil applications. And what it means is you have a sea of input data. And within that sea, you take some stencil, some subset of that. And for everything in that stencil, we're going to do some operation on each of those inputs to create a partial result. And that could be a multiplication. If it's a filter, this is a multiplication. And then what we do is we take all these terms and we basically um, add them together. But it could be various different operations, and we create a single output. But that's actually not enough. What we have to do is then basically have the next output we need to construct use almost the same inputs and just a few new ones. And in fact, because we're scanning and scan lines, the only really new data we have to fetch from DRAM is in green. So we're fetching a very small number of things for the outputs. But the problem is that this computation is so efficient, we can't just do one kernel and write the data back to memory because that's too slow. I mean, that, that isn't enough computation. That computation costs so little energy. We have to actually gang a bunch of these different kernels together in the hardware to do enough operations to basically amortize the cost of that memory energy. And so this means that you have to program in space and not time. And that's what makes making this a programmable unit hard. Now, of course, my research group at Stanford is working on this problem. We've already developed a domain-specific language to specify applications of this class. We have a compiler for that domain-specific language. We can run x86 code so people on the algorithm side can play with their algorithms and evaluate it. And we have an ability to convert this into FPJs and ASICs right now. But I want to step a little back from that and think a little bit more broadly about what we need to do to enable innovation. Because I think the key thing to realize is that if we want energy efficient computing, we're not just going to build hardware. We have to change the way we do algorithm design. And that means that we're going to have to enable algorithm experts to play. Because they're the only people who know how to cheat, how to change their algorithm, and still get good results. And this gives back to this trade-off between risk and effort, or costs. If we want the algorithm designers to play and to create better computing devices, we're going to have to minimize the cost to them to do this exploration. That is, if it's going to take them months of time or years of time, and they're going to have to write Verilog, it's not going to happen. We have to give them a much higher level development platform in which them, for them to play. And fortunately, there are a number of people who are working on these kinds of platforms. People talk about building chip generators or constructors rather than building instances. And at Stanford, there's a project on that as well. But these are projects that are going on all over the country. But to end, I just want to step even further back and say, look, remember what I said about CMOS computing or the future of CMOS computing. It is true that the performance-limited applications are going to be power limited. But there are lots of other applications that are not that performance constrained. So not all systems are on the bleeding edge. I think this, this fact was driven home when um, Nest 
which was a company that builds basically networked home appliance, uh, uh, appliances, was uh, acquired by Google for a couple billion dollars. Those systems are not performance limited in the sense that we think about, but they were a very nice application solution to a network device. So what do we need to really enable more people to play and to create more innovative products that leverage hardware? I mean, I think we should take a page out of the playbook for software and look at what Apple and Google did in their different application stores. They created a, basically a framework that made it much easier to create applications and then a marketplace for those people who created those applications to monetize them. I don't think it's inconceivable that, I, in fact, I think it's very reasonable to believe that we could do the same thing with hardware. We can't do the space of all possible hardware because that's just too complicated and it would be too hard to do that design. But we can take sets of hardware, build a very strong development environment so that app de designers can essentially write code with some constraints on it and from that they can generate not only the software for their system but the system itself. I think this whole approach is possible. It's not going to be easy. But what it's going to require is that we create a system that attracts a broad range of talent. Clearly, it's going to have to attract the people who have application ideas. But at the same time, we also have to attract people who like and understand hardware to continue to enrich that infrastructure to bring new hardware designs into that environment. And I think this is feasible because it's happened before. For those of you who know about the Arduino design environment, it's an environment that invites people who know nothing about hardware to build hardware, but it also has attracted a number of people who know about hardware to continue to enrich it and add new devices to that system and really has created a vibrant open source platform. I think we can do the same thing moving forward to enable people to make it even easier to design these platforms. So in conclusion, it is the case that technology is not scaling as well as it used to, and we're not getting as much energy savings from technology as we used to expect. But let's take that and instead of making it a problem, let's make it an advantage, let's take advantage of it. Because if technology is scaling more slowly, first of all, there's not gonna be a killer microprocessor that's gonna outdo you in two years when your product first comes out. And secondly, the techniques that we need to do design are actually stabilizing. So let's basically codify those and make them easier to do. If we can do that, then we can attract our friends, the applications experts, into this area of designing hardware or at least designing applications that require modified hardware. And we can basically have the innovative bloom that happened in the mid-1980s when the whole ASIC revolution happened, when placement and routing and synthesis allowed a whole new group of people to take part of hardware. We now need to do the same thing, but a level up. This is going to take a lot of work, and I hope all of you will join us to make it happen. Thank you very much for your attention.